God, in our situations. God, through open up, allow you to be glorified. God, through you would have your way. Have your way, oh God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We bless your holy name, oh God. We bless your holy name, Lord God. God, you're so wonderful. God, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. We give you all the praise and all the glory, oh God. God, move in this place. Move in this place. God, we just bless your holy name. We just bless your holy name, oh God. We bless your holy name, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise, Lord God. God, move in this place. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We need you, Lord God. We need you, Lord God. We need you, Lord God. God, none of us are perfect, but we're striving to be perfected daily. Daily, we need your perfection. Daily, we need to get up from our sin, from our mess, Lord God, and say, God, I surrender. God, please forgive me. Please wash me. Clean me up, Lord God. God, that we would turn from those things, Lord God, and we would focus on you. God, that we cast every care on you, because your word says you care for us, Lord God. That we would just lay it all down in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless your holy name, O oh God. We bless your holy name, Lord God. Hallelujah. 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 God, move in the service today. Move in the service today, Lord God. We bless your holy name, O oh God. We bless your holy name, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We just worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. God, we submit the service into your hands. We say, do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. God, that you would be glorified and that you would just move in this time. We thank you right now. We thank you right now. We thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go ahead and get into praise and worship. Feel free just to let go and allow God to move in this place. Amen. Amen. And amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The Lord says in the Bible that this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. It's good to see the. Went down into 
to the deepest valley. Looked all around down there, couldn't find nobody. I went across the deep blue seas, couldn't find one to compare. To your grace, your love, your mercy. Nobody greater, nobody greater than you. I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody. No, 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 nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. Looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody. No, 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 nobody greater. Nobody greater, Jesus. Nobody greater than you. And this is why nobody can heal like you can. Most holy one, you are the great I am. Awesome in all your ways and mighty is your hand. You are he who carried out redemption's plan. You are he who carried out redemption's plan. Say search, search all over. Couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low. Still couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater. Nobody greater, Jesus. Nobody greater than you. Searched all over. Searched all over. Couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Nobody greater than you, Lord. Nobody greater, nobody, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Your name is above all names. Your name. Your name is above all names. Your name is above all names. You're worthy of all our praise. You're worthy of all our praise. Mighty are the works of your hand. 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 Your name is above all names. Your name. Your name is above all names. You're worthy of all our praise. You're worthy of all our praise. Oh, mighty are the works of your hands. Mighty are the works of your hands. Mighty are the works of your hands, Lord. Mighty are the works of your hands. Mighty are the works of your hands. Mighty are the works of 
to the, the first song that said I searched all over couldn't find nobody searched all over couldn't find nobody like you nobody like you all over, come on. Searched all over, couldn't find nobody. Searched all over, couldn't find nobody like you. Nobody like you. Searched all over, searched all over, couldn't find nobody. Searched all over, couldn't find nobody like you. Nobody like you. I ran all over. Ran all over, couldn't find nobody. Ran all over, couldn't find nobody like you. Nobody like you. Searched all, searched all over, couldn't find nobody. Searched all over, couldn't find nobody like you. Nobody like you. Nobody like you. Ooh, ooh, nobody, nobody like you. You may be seated. Give the Lord a hand as you sit down. Thank you, Lord. This is going to be a little bit different service, obviously. Um, we want to first of all acknowledge the the family here. The see, we've got Sabrina, Kevin, King, Divinis, Kathy, or Kat, Catherine. 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 Divinis not here. I'm sorry. But anyway, we want to say welcome to you guys. I know you guys made a long trip, and it had to be a quick one. But we just want to say thank you for being here with us. Um, so what what I plan to do is because everybody I know I don't know if everybody can stay for the the service so I plan to do a a little bit of a sermon but then we'll break and then we'll transition into the uh, the memorial service part if that's okay with everybody because um, I think there you know some people brought some flowers and we want to set that out and all that so if that's okay we won't be long, and I really promise not to be long today. Um, but we want to say, first of all, I want to say this because it's in the air that I believe that Unique was a believer. Unique believed in the Lord Jesus, and even though her life was taken early, uh, that's the tragedy, but the good news is that she is now with the Lord, and we don't have to be sad about that part. Amen? Amen? And so, 
and it is hard. I, look, it's hard for me. I, I've known a little bit. I've known her for about 12, 13 years, I think, somewhere around there. And she's like a daughter uh, in, a, in a sense. Uh, she used to call me her dad in a way. So it is hard. It's always hard when you deal with kids, people that are younger than you that have passed away. I mean, I'm used to it. My, my uncle just passed away, and he was 90. So he lived a good long life. And it wasn't so hard to see him go, but it's harder when it's somebody that's 35 in the mid 30s. Because um, my son's, my oldest son is 40. Um, and my youngest son is 35. So it's just not easy dealing with that. So I understand what everybody's going through. Um, we've lost somebody just as well as you guys have, uh, not as close, obviously, but clearly something that has affected us all. Amen? So let's pray, and then I'll, I'll touch on a little bit of what we were going to touch on, and then we'll uh, transition from there. And we wanted to also do communion for those that want to join us with communion. Today is the first Sunday we usually do that, so I wanted to also do that as well. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, first of all, that we can always rejoice. We're, no, we're not sad. We're not downtrodden. But because Jesus has done for us what he has done, we can be grateful. And we don't have to worry because once we accept you as our Savior, eternal life enters into our bosoms. And so we no longer have death, but we have life. So thank you, Lord, for the life that comes and I pray that you would help me to give life as I share the word of God. Because the most important thing is that you said if we search the scriptures in them, we will find eternal life. And that eternal life is in your son. So thank you for opening, us our, opening up our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our will to do what you've called us to do at this time and this season. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. So I, I'm, I was doing a series on revival and renewal, and I was going through some of the reasons why we need to be revived or we need to, re, be, re, to be renewed. I made a distinction between revival and renewal, and the difference being revival is for those that don't know God. You revive things that are dead, but you renew those things that are, have been uh, alive but need to be refreshed like your home when you renew or renovate your house you don't usually tear it all down and start over again but you work on one room or that bathroom needs to be fixed or that kitchen needs to be updated or whatever so renewal is updating you so that you can get on the same page as God but revival is to get in the game so that you can do the will of God. And that's the distinction. But there's a couple of things we talked about last week that causes us to new, know that we need to be revived or renewed. Number one was we don't, we don't pray. Number two, um, we're, we become self-dependent. Three, we don't read the Bible. And so we started, and now, so now we're going to the other parts and the other, the, one of the other ways we can tell we need God to touch us in a new way is our inability to see beyond what is in front of us and not believe God for what is not in front of us. The Bible says we, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So that means that many times and because we are natural people we are governed for the most part by our five senses but the spirit of god when he comes into our lives changes our ability to see just in the natural and to keep our eyes on the things that are unseen now that sounds like a contradiction because how can you see what you can't see with your natural eye the Bible also talks about he that has eyes to see, let him see, which means if you don't see what you think you need to see, your vision needs to be corrected. And it's not just by glasses, but you need spiritual vision. 
And a lot of times when we get, uh, when we start to lose our, our edge, so to speak, spiritual edge, we need to get a new vision of what God wants and not just what we see. The problem with life is that it's so present, if you know what that means. The problems are present. Our, our situations are present. Everything is right now, right in our face. Here today has got to be addressed. But God said, don't allow those things to change the way you believe and, or the way you live. And it's very difficult because those things are present. They're here. They're now. But the Bible says that we have to put our trust in him and not lean on our own understanding. The miracles that happened in the Bible were people who were facing a dilemma, but looked outside of that dilemma for the solution, and God came and did a miracle in their lives. For instance, when the, the story of the woman who was going to eat what she had, she, she ran into Elisha, Elijah, excuse me, and she was gathering sticks and Elijah was told by God to go to her specifically and she was going to sustain him doing, during the famine and the drought. And all she had, she said, look, all I got is a, a, a cruise of oil and some meal and I'm going to make a cake for me and my son and we're going to eat it and we're just going to waste away until, because we don't have anything left. But the prophet who said, that we walk by faith and not by sight, although he didn't say that then. The Bible says that later. He says, don't worry about it. But he says, make a cake for not only for you, but make a cake for me first. And then make one for you and your son. And then he, he prophesied and he said, for thus says the Lord, your meal barrel will not waste away nor your oil empty until the rain or the famine is over. And that according to the story in that Bible, this, uh, that Bible story, they ate for however long that was until it rained and therefore she could get a new harvest because the meal did not run out or the oil did not run dry. But some, sometimes people th hear these stories in the Bible and they think they're fairy tales. Turn off your devices if you can or mute them if you can. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> But they're not fairy tales. They are God intervening. A miracle is simply this. And a lot of people try to define what a miracle is. But a miracle is simply God stepping in from the natural, into the natural and changing it and doing something supernatural in the natural. In other words, when you're sick and, he does, and you're healed, that's a God stepping into the natural and changing the natural by the, his supernatural power. And so when we only see what is around us, then we're limited to, we're limit, not only do we limit us on our ability to know what's going to happen, but we limit God. Uh, let me go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And it says here, thank you, little fella. For by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went without knowing where he was going. Now, most of us, if we heard that, we were saying, we're not going until we know. I, I hear you, God, but I, if, you, I, if you don't tell me where I'm going, I'm not leaving this place. And that's because we haven't got to the place where we can trust the unseen more than we can trust the seen. Amen? But God wants us to put our trust in him. Faith in his word is believing that the promises that God has shared with us will come to pass when we need them to come to pass. How many have been in a situation where they give you a deadline and they said, if you don't do this by this date, just there's going to be some consequences. How many have had those kind of things happen to them? I think everybody has, right? 
And a lot of times, what you do, what do you do? You go into a panic mode. Oh, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't have that. I won't have it by then. I, I know if I do this and I can do this and maybe I can have most of it, but I don't, I don't have it. I don't know what I'm going to do. And all you do is you go to worrying. But you, when you see what's beyond being there to be seen, you say, Lord, I don't have it, but I know who you do. And so you're going to have to open a door because I don't see the door that I'm supposed to walk into. That's what happens when you get stale in your relationship. All you do is what you can do and then what you can't do, you don't know what to do because you don't have an answer for what you can't do. But God steps in when you can't do what needs to be done. That's what he does. Amen? So we have to re remember that we don't limit what we have to or what we know to what we only see, but we, limit, we don't limit God at all. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he shall direct your path. But the key is that you have to believe that. He will not direct you if you refuse to be directed. If you ever been in a car with somebody and you're trying to help them, they're not sure where they're going. Now, GPS has saved most of us from this problem. But when I was a young man, we didn't have GPS. And there were times when you were going someplace and somebody said, well, I know where we're going. And then they, they start going and then you realize they don't know where they're going. And then you try to say, well, no, you don't need to go this way. You need to know, look, I know where I'm going. And then you ride for a while, and he says, no, he doesn't know where he's going. He's going the opposite direction. No, we need to turn around. No, I know where I'm going. And so you don't, you, you don't like riding with those kind of people, do you? Because they're not willing to be directed when they know they're wrong. And that's how many times we are. God is trying to direct us, but we say, no, God, I'm okay. I know this. I got this. I'm, I'm, I've been here before. So let me deal with this. Let me drive this time and then you drive in a place that you don't want to be. So we, that's what he's trying to get us to say. When you're lacking, where, when you're walking in a place where you're only seeing what's there to be seen, you need a refreshing so that your eyes can be opened and your ears can listen what, to what God is saying to you. Amen? Amen? The next thing is a big one is a lack of self-denial. The Bible requires us to deny ourselves. And let's go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. This is a struggle for almost anybody who either is a new believer or an old believer. It really doesn't matter because we all don't want to surrender. Look at your neighbor and say, help me to surrender, Lord. Say it with conviction. Say, Lord, help me to surrender. Matthew 16, 24, I think I said, right? Oops, come on now. If I can count, I could get there. And it says this here, then the disciples said to his, excuse me, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and let and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So he says, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that you don't do anything? You make no decisions? Of course, that's not what it means. It means that you have to run what you're going to do through God before you do it. In other words, you say, Lord, I know what I want to do. I have a plan, but is this the plan that you have for me? And then you have to wait and see once he speaks and directs you, he will give you direction. I remember when I was a young man a long, long time ago, I was getting ready to apply to law school and 
I was 20, I think I was 23 or 22, something like that. And I wasn't sure of this. I had just gotten saved when I was about 19, just before my 19th birthday. And I'd been married for about three or four years, two or three years, I think. Had, we had our first son at that time. And I was getting ready to graduate from college. And I wanted to go to law school. So I had filled out my law school applications. And I was walking down the aisle. I was going to the University of Washington. I was walking down the street to the law school to drop off my application. And I looked up to heaven. I said, Lord, I want to be a lawyer. I, this is what I have wanted to do. However, if this is not what you want me to do, then close the door. Don't let me get accepted to any of these schools and I will know that that is your direction and I'll go do something else and I'll never look back because I know that that's not what you want me to do. So I put my applications in and, and I only applied to two schools because I was, like I said, we were newly married and we had the first grandchild in our family and so we wanted to stay and we needed the help of our parents so we didn't want to leave. And then both doors, I applied for two law schools and both of them accepted me. So I believe that that was the door that God had opened for me. Now there was challenges when I got into law school. I struggled and in a while we struggled in our marriage and I almost, I won't say I almost failed because I didn't fail, but you had to maintain a certain grade point average to get out. And I fell under that grade point average. And we were at odds and fighting, and, but it was the thing that got me there. The door that he opened to get me there reminded me that he will, if he's gonna open it to get me in, he's gonna open it to get me out. So I said to my wife, because most of it was my fault, I just have to be honest. I said, look, I don't know what it's gonna take, because I wanted to graduate. I've been in school for eight and a half years, and I was on the, I said, Lord, I don't want to go this far and fail now. I said, look, I don't know what it's going to take, but we need to get this thing right between us. Because the Bible says if you're not right with your wife, then your prayers are not going to be heard. So I said, I can't keep praying to God and expecting him to hear me if I don't get right with my wife. So I had to get right with her, and we got right, and we got things right, and guess what? I graduated. Obviously, because I've been a lawyer for now for like 34 years, so <laughs> I made it out. And there have been challenges in the, in the process. People have accused me falsely of all sorts of things. You know, you know the stories they tell about lawyers, right? <laughs> yeah, I know you guys are you're thinking of them now, right? But most of them, they think that lawyers are liars and cheaters and swindlers and but I told them, if you want to see an honest lawyer, just look straight ahead. I'm one of them. But I've been accused of being dishonest. I've been lied upon. I've been cheated. I've, people turned me into the bar to try to get me disbarred and suspended. But I came back to the door that he opened when I was 22 years old. I said, God, you didn't open that door so somebody else could close it. And so every time that happened, he brought me out of it because I hadn't done anything wrong. And so I'm saying this to say that when you learn to deny yourself and you're doing those things that God wants you to do, he will continue to prosper you in that vein or allow you to continue. He says he'll open doors that nobody can close and he'll close doors that nobody can open. So you have that assurance that no matter what the enemy does, you will prosper or you will be victorious. That doesn't mean that I won't have to go through stuff. Because if you ask my wife, he said, man, you were terrible. You were miserable. You were, couldn't sleep. You couldn't do anything. You wouldn't, you know, all that stuff. I'm going through it in the middle, but I'm still trying to remember you're going to bring me out of it. And he did. So we have to learn to deny ourselves because as we do that, we're now walking his course and we're not walking our own. He doesn't guarantee su success on your course, but he does guarantee success. And I'm not talking about financial success. I'm talking about where doors won't be closed on you 
that should not be closed. Amen? Amen. So in the last one, and then I'm going to close, is the lack of obedience to the truth that we know. Now got, get that right. Get that. Not the lack of obedience to the truth you don't know. Because you can't obey things you're not, you don't know. But you're not obeying the things that you do know. And one example would be if I, like what I was talking about with my wife and I when we were going through the stuff at, in law school, if I didn't know that I was supposed to get my life right with my wife, if I wanted God to answer my prayers, I just say, I ain't got her studied about. I'm going to just do what I got to do. No, he's not going to hear me. There have been times where I have sat in my prayer room and so started to pray and God would speak to me and say, you need to tell your wife such and such. Okay, Lord, I'll get to that. I'll, uh, and he says, and I try to ignore that and I would continue to pray. And he said, you might as well get up and get out of here because I can't hear nothing you're saying until you go tell her what I just told you to tell her. And I said, well, Lord, didn't you already forgive me? You know, I'm doing, doing what we all do. You forgave me. I confessed it. Why do I have to tell her? <laughs> because the two of you are no longer two, but you're one. So are you going to do it or not? And I struggled. You know, sometimes I waited a whole day. It's like, well, I'll, I'll wait sure she's in a good mood or I'll make sure. <laughs> all the things we try to do, but finally he says, you, if you don't do it, and then all of a sudden your heart starts beating because you know he's getting serious because he keeps telling you. And then you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. And if I get hit with the frying pan, I just get hit with the frying pan. That's just the way it is. But thank God she didn't hit me with the frying pan. She, she might have not spoken to me for a while, but we did finally get it right. And that's what keeps us because we do the truth that we know to do. See, the truth is a dangerous thing because once you know it, you have to do it. You have to do something with it. You cannot no longer say, I didn't know. Once you know, you can't say, I didn't know. And so God requires us to do the truth that we know. And that's a big problem in the church. And I'm not talking about just in this building, it's here too. But in the church as a whole, we don't do the truth that we know. And therefore God is not moving like he could because we're, be, we're walking in, in some case, uh, we're walking in a passive aggressive stance towards God. You guys know what that means? Passive aggressive, it means you, you know you're supposed to do something, but you're not going to do it because you don't want to do it. But you know you're supposed to, but you just don't want to get, you know, all this dissonance, as they call it, in your heart because you're not allowing God to lead you. But until you release that point, God will not move in your life. So let's go to Romans, Romans 6, 17, and then we'll close. on this and then we'll transition to the next phase. It says this, uh, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine of which you were dis delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. Now you might say, well, how does that t say what you're trying to say? Well, he said, once, you, once you're set free from sin, you're no longer subject to the sin. But what happens is when you start to not doing what God tells you to do, you put yourself back into subjection to sin because you're presently in disobedience. And therefore, God can't hear you. The Bible says that my arm is not short that I cannot save, nor my ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from me so that I will not hear. And that's what happens when we don't do the truth that we know to do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray and we'll close and we'll do, we'll do communion and then we'll transition. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would take these few words that I've spoken and speak to our hearts and lead us 
into a place where we can be closer to you. Let us be what you've called us to be. Point us in the direction that you want us to walk in so that we know that we're walking in your will. You said in your model prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Lord, help us to be the ones that carry your will on earth as it is in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. So at this point, we're going to receive communion. And what we do with communion is we, everybody, if, you're, if you've accepted Christ, everybody can take communion. There are some that have what's called closed communion. We don't do that. If you believe that Jesus is your Savior, you're welcome to take communion. But what we do is we distribute it out to everyone before we drink and we eat the emblems of communion. And then we, we and also we stand up together. But before that, we also take some time. The Bible says, examine yourselves and don't take the communion elements in, a, in an unworthy manner. So we like to take time. If you need to confess something, to God, confess something to somebody else, we give you this time to do that. So let's take a few minutes and do that, and I'll come back and we'll pray, and then we'll pass the elements of communion out. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you would wash us and cleanse us by your precious blood. We confess our sin, Lord. We confess that sometimes we've said things we shouldn't have said. We've clearly done things we shouldn't have done. But you said if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness, unrighteousness. So thank you, Lord. And Lord God, we now dedicate these emblems, these emblems of your blood and your body. We ask that you would use them to remind us of the time that you broke your body. You were broken for our sake and your blood was spilled for our sins to be washed away. And so Lord, as we drink this cup and eat this bread, we proclaim your death until you return. So thank you for those that are taking it and bless them as they renew their covenant with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath. And so what we do is everybody, once you get it, stand to your feet, shake that cup up, because it's been sitting there for a while, and it kind of settles to the bottom. So shake it up. And the, the bread is on the top layer for those that haven't done this. And the cup is under, and the, and the uh, juice is on the under layer. So you have to peel top layer first and then the under layer afterward. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we As we always do, we like to read the scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. 
He said, for I received the Lord, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and bread, and he had given thanks. He broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And we always like to raise the cup up as a token of victory, knowing that Jesus not only died, but he rose from the dead. Let's drink together in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Just pass your cup. Philippians 4, my favorite verse, it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And that is so powerful to me when I first recommitted my life back to Christ and said that, you know, I really want to live for him and be real about living for him. It just was so powerful to me to realize that no matter what people said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. He would give me strength to conquer whatever fears I had, to overcome any obstacles and know that he is with me. So if God is with me, he'll strengthen me and he'll help me along the way. And I want you to be encouraged and know that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. One of my favorite scriptures in this season is Isaiah 53, 5. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Every day, I say that scripture and I command my body to believe the word of the Lord that I am healed by the stripes of Jesus because it says in Revelations 12 and 11 we overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony so we have to speak the word of God into our lives we have to speak the word of God into our bodies even when we don't feel well that's when we especially speak the word of God when we feel great we still speak and confess and declare the word of God over our lives that's how we begin to see the results that's how we begin to have victory in our lives so whatever scripture that is one of your favorite make sure daily that you confess declare and confess those scriptures over your life and you will soon see a change Amen. Today, I want to share another scripture with you. This is a scripture that my kids hear me talk about a lot. And um, I think it's important that we have the right attitude when we go through life. We're coming today from Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. And it says this, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, there's a couple of things I really want to talk about in here is do what you do with all of your heart and not to men, but to God. I remember being young, serving in a church, in a ministry, and there was a time that we were calling people to come do some things, and a lot of people didn't show up, and I actually was frustrated. And God spoke to me. It was like a still, small voice. Even in the midst of my frustration, he said, who are you doing this for? When he said that, I was like, man, God, I'm doing this for you. Then he says, don't worry about who else is not here do it unto me that that rocked my world and that really helped change my viewpoint on the things that I do and why I do them so I want to encourage you don't worry about who's in your corner or who's not in your corner don't worry about what is looking like whether you got people chasing you and people excited about what you're doing do your work unto the Lord and you will receive the reward the reward the main reward is well done my good and faithful servant 
That's what I want to hear. That's what I'm living my life for. So every day I wake up, it doesn't matter if I'm cleaning the dishes. It doesn't matter if I'm taking care of my kids. It, it, whatever you do, do it unto 